In other words, the Lord is saying, my covenant with you is dependent upon your faithfulness to the covenant, to the law, and upon your keeping of it. That the children of Israel understood that is apparent from that dramatic and powerful event that took place shortly after Israel entered Canaan when the nation was assembled on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And all the blessings of the law were read. And all the curses of the law were read. And when every blessing of the law was read, the people said, Amen. They understood it. Keep my law, God said, and you are blessed. And all the curses of the law were read, and to every curse the people said, Amen, and said, if we do not keep God's law, we will be cursed. They all understood that. If you understand what happened at Ebal and Gerizim from that point of view, then you say to yourself, that was a reckless, <coughs> irresponsible response of the people. They were assuming responsibility for keeping the law. They were saying to God, we understand, we'll keep the law, then we'll be blessed. And we understand if we break the law, we will be cursed. I would never dare to say that. And it seems reckless in the extreme. But nevertheless, the, the people responded with a loud Amen to every blessing and curse of the law. Why? Because they knew they could not keep the law. They knew it was for them an impossibility. And yet God said, you have to. Or I, you are not my covenant people. You have to keep the law. Or I will cast you out of my presence. That's what happened, as you know. Judah, first the 12 tribes, and then Judah could not keep that law. The history of the kings from David and Solomon on is one of the saddest pieces of history that I have ever read. <clears throat> Wicked kings came on the throne and led the nation in ways of idolatry and disobedience to the law. Until finally, the nation was ripe for judgment. Josiah in Judah came along as, it, as Judah's last good king. And Josiah tried to bring reformation to the nation. And God said to Josiah, it's too late. It's too late. This people is an idolatrous people. They do things which even the heathen do not do. They are wicked in the extreme. They trample underfoot my covenant. They break my commandments. They murder the prophets. They do every evil and abomination in my sight that their wicked hearts can invent. And so you have that sad scene there in Bethlehem where Jerusalem that beautiful city, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. In ashes, a heap of smoking rubble. And that glorious temple of Solomon destroyed and burned to the ground with its remaining riches in the coffers of the king of Babylon. With shame with utter degradation, with the horrors of what their evil had done, their failure to keep the law in front of their eyes. They watched Judah destroy. So if you ask, what was the fault of the Old Covenant? Then you must answer that question by saying, the Old Covenant in its, in its administration depended upon the keeping of the law. It did. And Israel and Judah could not keep the law. That's a serious fault. 
So serious a fault is that, that it means, in effect, the covenant between God and Judah is everlastingly impossible. Then imagine the powerful words of Jeremiah as he stood there on the side of a hill, I presume, while all the strong men of Judah and all Judah's sons and daughters, stripped naked, bound in chains, were ready to be led to Babylon by the cruel Babylonian soldiers. <coughs> Jeremiah had pointed out repeatedly to the nation, you walk in the ways of the wicked, you serve idols, and this will inevitably happen. But they didn't listen. And then Jeremiah says, Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. That's powerful. Before we enter into that, however, there's one more point I have to make, and that is this important point. I said at the beginning of the sermon <coughs> that although the new covenant is better than the old, the old is good. Otherwise, the word better would not be used to describe it. And the question is, in what sense of the word can that old covenant, which Israel could not keep, be called good? What was good about it? The answer to that question is found in the epistle of Paul to the Galatians talking about the covenant that God made with Abraham. These Galatians, by the way, to whom Paul is writing, were just like the Hebrews. The, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews is written and inspired by the Holy Spirit because this rather large and growing Jewish community that was found in Jerusalem and in all the major centers of the Mediterranean world it was a community from which God had saved his elect. There were Jewish Christians in many of these communities, but they were persecuted, as the epistle to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 12. They were persecuted because they confessed their faith. Paul says to these Hebrews, you weren't persecuted all that bad. You mustn't think that you suffer a great deal. You have not suffered, Paul says to them, unto blood. But they were mocked. They were ridiculed. They were charged with treason. They were charged with rebelling against the heritage of the fathers and banishing all those rituals that characterize the Old Testament worship of God. And so, maybe some of them lost their jobs. I don't know. But they considered the persecution so intense that they couldn't bear it anymore, and so they were tempted to go back to their old religion, to the old Judaism of the Jewish nation, and this is what Paul is warning against throughout the epistle. You go back, you're exchanging a better covenant or a covenant that is faulty. It's like having in your possession a treasure chest of diamonds and emeralds and sapphires and rubies and exchanging it for a bag full of dime store trinkets and cheap jewelry. That's what you're doing. And the warning of the epistle of the Hebrews to the Hebrews is, you must not do that. That was the problem.